The MP4s for the Respiratory System Infections chapter, chapter 22, will be in two parts. So this will be the first part of the set of two MP4s that will cover the Respiratory System Infections chapter 22. If you have not had anatomy and physiology, these are images of the upper respiratory system, which includes the nasal and oral cavities, the ear, and the pharynx. For our purposes, you can think of the pharynx as the throat. There are different parts to the pharynx, but it starts at the oral pharynx, so we can think of it as the pharynx. There are many different structures in the upper respiratory system that can help to be one of the first defenses against the entry of microorganisms. We have tonsils, we have mucous membranes, we have epithelial layers. We have many different structures um, that can help to trap some of the microorganisms and prevent it from descending uh, further down into the respiratory tract, but these are the structures of the upper respiratory tract. This is an image of the lower respiratory system, so the lower respiratory tract. This includes things like our trachea, our bronchi, our lungs, and you can get minute down to alveolar sacs. And farther down, we have many different membranes again and different structures. We have cilia. We have, we have defenses within the lower respiratory system. But as the microorganisms descend down lower into the lower respiratory system, we have greater severity of infections that can occur because fluid can build up in our lungs. We can have inflammation in our lungs that can prevent gas exchange. And these infections can be much more serious and often fatal. So we hope that these microorganisms will be trapped as they descend down so that they do not reach the lower respiratory system, but sometimes they do. And we will look at some infections that do infect the lower respiratory system. Our mucous membranes are a great defense that is found in our respiratory system. They're found in many systems, but we're talking specifically here about the respiratory system. When we think about the mucous membranes of the respiratory system, we know that it's sticky, that it's acidic, that it can inhibit um, microbial attachment as those microorganisms are coming into the mouth and trying to go downward into the lower respiratory system. The cilia are there. The cilia can trap and prevent things from going deeper. The mucous membranes don't shed, but they can be damaged by microorganisms. But you hope that the cilia that are part of the respiratory system's mucous membrane layer, it's often called the mucociliary escalator. We hope that if the microorganisms come into contact with that mucociliary escalator, that it will propel the microorganisms upward. And when it does that, you can potentially swallow those microorganisms um, to get rid of them, or you can cough them out. Some microorganisms have virulence factors and have things about them, special enzymes, that can prevent the mucociliary escalator from working. But we hope that this defense can protect us from some of the more severe types of respiratory infections. Our upper and lower respiratory tracts also have a normal microbiota. And again, our normal microbiota can really protect us from the attachment of pathogenic microorganisms. But under certain conditions, some of this bacteria that is in our normal microbiota can become opportunistic and become pathogenic.
And again, we do have that mucociliary escalator. It contains mucus producing goblet cells and that cilia that can propel those microorganisms upward. If it stays working and if the bacteria doesn't attack the mechanism of that mucociliary escalator. Some of you might have had strep throat before. I haven't had strep throat, so I don't know what it feels like, but I have heard it's the worst sore throat that people have ever had, and it feels like there's razor blades in the back of your throat. You can see how red and raw it looks. This is caused by streptococcal pyogenes, which we have seen before in the skin and eye infections chapter, but this is for the respiratory chapter. And here we see it ca causing streptococcal pharyngitis. In this case, streptococcal pyogenes is resistant to phagocytosis. It has virulence factors that can help to prevent the immune system from being able to get rid of it. It also has enzymes, streptokinases, that can lyse blood clots. And that's what causes that really red rawness to the back of the throat. Also, it has streptolysins, which are cytotoxic, cytotoxic, which can kill the cells that are in the back of your throat. Both of those together cause that very severe redness and that pain to that uh, strep throat that you can have. Now, it can be diagnosed with a rapid antigen test. It's a throat swab, and it is a very fast test. In the lab, we look at this uh, bacteria, and we look to see um, how it lyses blood auger, and that's um, how you can also test to see if this is a pathogenic form of strep. So you do that throat swab, swab culture um, to see if you have it because you could have it and maybe it gets better after a while but you really should find out if you have had strep throat before because there are serious complications that you can have. You can have rheumatic fever or scarlet fever or glomerulonephritis which is a kidney infection. These are complications that can occur following strep throat. Also, some people can become carriers of strep throat because it's resistant to phagocytosis. Our immune system is not always able to get rid of it completely. So sometimes if you become a carrier, this infection will come back repeatedly. This is another image of strep throat. Again, you can see that red, very raw looking infection in the back of the throat causing a great deal of pain. And you can also see a pus pocket that is up on the right hand side of this image. Remember pyogenes has that pyo part of the word, which means that it can cause pus formation. Now, we really should treat this infection with antibiotics because of the risk of the complications that can occur from strep throat. Those are very serious infections that can occur. Rheumatic fever and scarlet fever can cause a lot of damage to the body. Um, and it's very important that if you have strep throat or if you think you have strep throat that you get a test to see if you have it and then you go through a course of antibiotics because those complications be can become life-threatening and also because you can become a carrier and it can come back repeatedly. Scarlet fever is one of those complications that can occur from untreated strep throat.
It will often present with these signs and symptoms. You can have a red macular rash. Remember, a macular rash is red and raised, but there's no fluid. And you can see in those images of how that macular rash can present. When you touch it, if you push on a red macular rash, it will blanch, which means it will turn white. But if you lift your finger up after you touch the red rash, the whiteness will go away and it will return back to that red color. Um, again, it's caused by S. pyogenes and another thing that this bacteria can produce is called an erythrogenic toxin. This is an inflammatory toxin. It's a super antigen that can cause a release of inflammatory cytokines. And it can cause very serious uh, complications. A unique sign for scarlet fever is the strawberry tongue. It's called that because the tongue is stripped away by, the surface of it is stripped away by an exfoliative toxin that Espiogenes has. So Espiogenes has a lot of things going on and it can cause a lot of complications in the body when it's causing infections. And one of them is scarlet fever. Again, it's a complication of untreated strep throat. As with all infections, you need to have a culture done by going to a doctor to see what type of bacteria might be causing the infection. And you have to look at all of the signs. Did they have a sore throat before, but it went away? Was there a really high fever? You have to combine all the signs together to make a diagnosis, but you also have to do a laboratory culture so you can make an accurate diagnosis. Remember, we don't want misdiagnoses to occur, and they can if we make assumptions. So we always want to do a laboratory culture to confirm Confirm if a person had strep throat or if they have scarlet fever. Diphtheria is an infection that we almost had eradicated, but due to the decrease in vaccinations by a number of people, it has kind of made its way back. Um, it is found in underdeveloped countries, and if people travel to those countries, um, they can bring it back to the United States. And because um, some people have chosen to not vaccinate their children, um, it has been able to infect a larger number of children. Um, it's caused by a gram-positive pleomorphic rod, which pleomorphic, if you remember, means that it can change its shape. And because it can change its, its shape, sometimes the immune system has a really hard time recognizing what it is. Um, vaccinations can be very, very helpful. It is preventable by a multiple dose vaccination. The D part, this is a combo vaccine, and we're going to talk about the infections that are contained within this DTaP vaccine. It's diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, and, um, but it's multiple doses, and you need to receive the multiple doses so that you can be protected from this type of an infection, from diphtheria. Um, the D part of that vaccination stands for the diphtheria toxoid that is present in that vaccine. Now, if you are infected with diphtheria, an advanced sign that you need to know is the pseudomembrane that can form in the back of the throat. It is a leathery mix of fibrin and dead tissue and bacteria, and it forms like a clot in the back of the throat. 
And this can be very, very serious if this infection occurs in infants because infants aren't able to tell you that they're not able to breathe or that this membrane is forming in the back of their throat. And so it can be very, very serious and it can be fatal because this pseudomembrane that is very classic to diphtheria can cover the airway completely and you won't be able to breathe. This is an image of a pseudomembrane that has formed on the back of the throat. You can see it's just a mass of dead tissue and um, fibrin and it just it becomes very tough and leathery and it will continue to grow in the back of the throat unless this is treated with antibiotics. So this is an infection where you need to have antibiotics. Oftentimes you have to have that pseudomembrane cut out because it can grow and close off that throat again and lead to suffocation. And again, it's a very, very classic sign that occurs from diphtheria. Pneumonia can be caused by many different types of microorganisms. The first one we're going to talk about in this chapter is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now you might recognize that pneumoniae. We've seen Klebsiella pneumoniae. And one of the virulence factors that Klebsiella pneumoniae had was a capsule. And remember that capsule can interfere with phagocytosis. It can prevent the immune system from being able to engulf it and get rid of it. Um, that capsule is used for attachment. It's also used because it's super sticky and it can stick to mucous membranes, but it really does prevent the immune system from being able to phagocytize it. And Streptococcus pneumoniae also has this virulence factor. It also has a capsule. It also is alpha hemolytic, which means that it can partially destroy red blood cells. It can also damage host cells by poking holes in them. It is, it has a pore forming protein, and so it can poke holes in the cells. Now this can cause the immune system to respond by uh, causing inflammation. And when it causes this inflammation, especially in the alveoli, it can cause fluid to build up in these air sacs. And when fluid builds up in these air sacs, it can become very serious because that's a barrier to gas exchange. It also creates an environment um, for more bacteria to grow because it likes to grow in that fluid. But as that fluid builds up, you become hypoxic because you are not able to exchange uh, oxygen and uh, you're not able to breathe when your lungs are filling up with fluid. So pneumonia is a very serious infection and it can be fatal. Here are some images from your textbook of Streptococcus pneumoniae, and you can see that it's a diplococcus. Some of the other microorganisms that can cause pneumonia include a form that often causes pneumonia in the elderly, but this has a vaccination available. So there is a pneumonia vaccination that is available for people who are at risk or people who are over 65. They are able to take this vaccination that can prevent Haemophilus influenzae. There's also mycoplasma pneumoniae. That's called walking pneumonia, the infection that's caused by this bacteria. The signs and symptoms are usually more mild. That's why it's called walking pneumonia. 
There are opportunistic pathogens, which are often nosocomial, which we've seen before, that can cause pneumonia in patients who are in the hospital. Again, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which we have seen before. It's very important that pneumonia is treated with, with antibiotics. This is an infection that should be treated with antibiotics when it is caused by a bacteria. And oftentimes, it is a gram-positive bacteria, and so there are many antibiotics that can be used to treat pneumonia because there are quite a few cell wall inhibitors out there that can be used in this type of an infection. Tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's an acid fast rod. If you remember in the lab, we looked at mycobacterium and how they could be acid fast. This is one type that can be. And remember those pink blobs were uh, what we saw on the slides to know that that uh, specimen that culture was an acid fast bacteria that we were looking at. Tuberculosis has that mycolic acid in its cell walls. That mycolic acid helps to resist phagocytosis. The immune system can try to keep this in check. It tries really hard, but it's often hard for the immune system to get rid of this particular bacteria. A lot of times tuberculosis can become a latent infection, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, it can become latent and go into a lysogenic state and be integrated into your genome and then be reactivated due to stress. This is one of those types of bacteria that likes to stay in the body um, for a very long time and it's very hard to treat. It takes many types of medications sometimes to treat tuberculosis. Um, there is human to human transmission from mycobacterium tuberculosis specifically. There are also other types of mycobacterium that can cause tuberculosis in other animals. Uh, tuberculosis can occur in cattle and it is thought that it can jump from cattle uh, to another species. There are also late stages of HIV before HIV becomes AIDS, where the individual will become susceptible to a very specific type of mycobacterium that can cause tuberculosis. This is an excellent image from your book that shows the pathogenesis of tuberculosis. So you inhale that mycobacterium in the form of a droplet and it can enter into your respiratory system. And if it's not phagocytized uh, by the immune system because of those mycolic um, acids that are in the cell walls of that mycobacterium, it can cause an inflammatory response when that mycobacterium hits the alveoli and a lot of fluid will build up and accumulate in the alveoli and then the inflammatory response will accelerate and become more and more fluid will accumulate and more neutrophils and macrophages will go to the alveoli to try and contain the mycobacterium. But that mycobacterium can get into those macrophages um, if the immune system is not able to kill them. Now within that uh, alveoli, a the it can multiply within that alveoli because of the fluid buildup again and um, bacteria likes to build up in fluid but the immune systems will try to form a shell around it if it's not able to phagocytize it so it forms this shell around it um, and that's called a granuloma 
Now, eventually, though, that granuloma is going to break down and release that mycobacterium, and it's just going to spread and form more tubercles in more alveoli, and it just continues to spread throughout the respiratory system. The image from your textbook was a very good way to simplify the pathogenesis of tuberculosis. If you would like to see more detail, that's what this slide is about. So that mycobacterium reach that alveoli and they can be ingested by the macrophages that are trying to get rid of it, but some will survive. So they continue to multiply in the macrophages and they cause a reaction that increases the fluid, brings more neutrophils and more macrophages to the area. And then they can calcify forming that tubercle. Now many of the macrophages will die um, and then the symptoms will appear. Um, symptoms can include things like a low-grade fever or night sweats, weakness, fatigue, weight loss. You could also have a cough or chest pain, uh, respiratory issues like shortness of breath. You might cough up blood um, when these macrophages um, have died. That's when those symptoms like that will appear. Now remember that mature tubercle is formed, but then it starts to liquefy and that liquef liquefaction can continue and more mycobacterium will spread throughout the respiratory system and it can get into the circulatory and the lymphatic system as well. Treatment for tuberculosis can be very long. It can take many, many years and you will be treated with many different types of antibiotics that will attack different parts of the life cycle of the bacteria or different structures of the bacteria. Um, some tuberculosis is becoming drug resistant. And that is one of the reasons why they use different types of antibiotics um, and many at the same time. It's a multi-drug treatment to get rid of tuberculosis. And again, it can take many, many years. And sometimes patients will be infected so severely that they will need to be um, quarantined in a special room and to be treated um, the health care providers will wear special respiratory uh, equipment in order to enter the rooms. Diagnosis of TB is done through a skin test and if you do go into health care you will be getting TB skin tests regularly and it's just a a uh, little test that's done on the arm and I will show you on the next slide what that looks like. However, if you test positive when you have that skin test, then you will have a follow-up of an x-ray or a CT to look at your lungs to see if you have TB. There is also, um, possibly you will have a a blood test as well to further diagnose whether you have T TB or not. If you have come from another country, you might have had a vaccine and so your body will have developed antibodies and that is what is being uh, causing the positive results on the TB test. But you can have that quantiferin TB gold test and it will help to show um, if it's a TB infection or antibodies that are causing uh, the positive TB skin test. And again, vaccines are available, but they are not available in the United States. I have been told by some of my colleagues that you are able to request a tuberculosis vaccine if that is the population that you are treating, if you are working with a lot of patients who do have TB, if that is your specialty, then you can request to receive a TB vaccine. But it is not something that is included in our vaccination schedule. 
This is that image from your textbook showing the skin test for TB. And again, it's just injected underneath the skin and you just have a little wheel that forms. Remember, we talked about wheels in the previous chapter. Now, this test has to be read within 48 to 72 hours. And a positive result will be redness and swelling or hardness. And the size is measured when you go back to have your TB test checked. And again, if you test positive, then you have to have follow-up tests. You have to have cultures and you have to have a blood test, perhaps an x-ray to determine if you are positive for tuberculosis. If you have a chest x-ray and you have tuberculosis, your chest x-ray might look something like this. Those white areas are fluid filled areas. That's where the fluid has built up in the alveoli and that mycobacterium is multiplying and causing granulomas, tubercles, that's why it's called tuberculosis, and it's forming those in the alveoli, and it's preventing gas exchange and causing a very serious infection. And it needs to be treated again with a multi-antibiotic regimen. Pertussis is also called whooping cough. You might have heard whooping cough and maybe not the word pertussis, but they are the same thing. And it is prevented with a vaccine. It is that combined vaccine that has diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. That AP part means acellular pertussis cell fragments. They just use cell fragments of the pertussis bacteria. This does have a couple important virulence factors. It has a capsule. Again, that capsule is for attachment. It's sticky. It also helps to resist phagocytosis. That capsule has many things that helps that bacteria to be pathogenic. It also has a tracheal cytotoxin that damages that mucociliary escalator. Remember, we, talk about, we talked about that mucociliary escalator that can propel the bacteria upward and out where you can swallow them or cough them out. But this is one of those bacteria that has a toxin that can destroy how that mucociliary escalator works. One of the classic signs and symptoms of pertussis is a very strong, violent cough that can occur. The way our respiratory system is built, we have a what's called a carina that's at the bottom of the trachea. It's like at the top of the V. And it has um, sensors in that area. And the idea of that carina is to help prevent things from entering the lungs. It's like the last passageway of something to get through to the lungs. And that carina has these reflexes in it that can help prevent things. When this bacteria reaches that, that carina, um, it causes a very violent cough that um, can be so hard that it can cause seizures. Um, it can cause uh, people to pass out because they're coughing so violently. And it can restrict the oxygen exchange to the point of causing um, serious uh, impacts to your brain because you need to have good blood flow at all times. And this bacteria tries to restrict that oxygen exchange and um, that good flow of um, oxygen throughout your body. Pertussis mostly involves children, and 50% of those cases are under the age of one. Many cases of pertussis will require hospitalization, and it can be fatal because of that oxygen being restricted. Those violent coughing spasms 
causing seizures and causing the child not to be able to breathe and exchange exchange oxygen. A lot of times it's underdiagnosed and underreported, and I'm not sure why that occurs, but it's kind of discouraging um, to have read that. You need to have a culture and an antigen test to see if that is what is happening. Is this the bacteria that is causing these terrible coughing spasms? What's unique about pertussis or whooping cough is the sound that occurs. The patient will cough, cough, cough really violently. That mucus um, accumulates in the lungs um, and it causes this strange whooping sound as the airway is restricted by the inflammation and the fluid and it causes this kind of a whooping squeal sound. They cough, 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 cough and then they have this whoop that's very classic to pertussis. That's why it's called whooping cough. The three stages of pertussis that you need to know. The first stage, the signs and symptoms are very similar to the common cold. It looks just like you're having a cold. You're sniffly, you might have a sore throat, Um, might have a little bit of a cough, but not much. And then you move into stage two, um, where there's violent coughing spasms and that characteristic whoop sound. We must have this infection diagnosed by this stage because after stage two, you, uh, antibiotics are not effective after stage two for pertussis infections. After, if you reach this stage and you don't have antibiotics, then the infection will continue. If you do have antibiotics, then you can go to stage three, which would be the convalescent stage. If you receive treatment for this infection and it's specific to this bacteria, then you will have a gradual recovery. Your coughing will be less um, and less severe if it's treated with antibiotics. Varicella zoster virus or chicken pox has nothing to do with chickens. That's just something that it's called. Like diphtheria and like pertussis, this has a vaccine and the vaccine has decreased the incidence and the occurrence of chicken pox. It is human and primate reservoir only. It has not been found in other animals. It's highly contagious and transmitted through respiratory droplets. It used to be years ago that a lot of parents would have something called a pox party. If someone in the neighborhood had the chicken pox, then they would have their child go to their house and play so that they would be infected by the chicken pox. And it was a, because there was this belief that chicken pox wasn't serious and it was just a rash that was itchy that occurred and then you would be fine. What we now know is that chicken pox leads to a secondary infection, which is more serious called shingles, which I'm going to talk about Um, in a few slides from now, but there is a latent uh, reaction, a latent virus that can occur and cause another type of infection from chicken pox. It is not just a simple virus um, that you get and then you're done with it. Um, It has signs um, that include those skin lesions that usually start on the torso, uh, maybe some on the face, they're in the center of the body, and then they spread to your arms and legs. They're very, very itchy. If it is very severe, this can be treated with acyclovir. 
We've seen before in the previous chapter that we can treat uh, herpes simplex virus 1 with acyclovir as well. Acyclovir is good for some viral infections and it can uh, be used to help with chicken pox. But usually um, chicken pox um, needs to run its course and you can take oatmeal baths to try and ease the itchiness. But this is not just a slight virus that causes just a rash and because it can be more serious. It's something that we, we should not have pox parties for. There was even a time um, that you could buy suckers on the internet that maybe a child had sucked on that had chicken pox and people would mail them from the mail to other people so that they could infect their kids with the chicken pox. It was a terrible thing. Um, not something that should be done now. This is a slide that shows what chicken pox lesions can look like, and they're very itchy. I mean, you can tell your child, don't itch those. Though. It's very hard not to. I had the chicken pox as a child, and I was told multiple times to not itch, and I scratched and scratched anyway. Unfortunately, I actually have some scars because of scratching chicken pox lesions. They... This is not a really simple type of an infection. It can be very serious and it can have complications from scarring to the virus that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. You can see in this image that the lesions are on the center of the body. That's where they start. They can be on the torso and on the face and then they move to the arms and legs. And this little child doesn't look very happy. It is really an uncomfortable type of infection. Diagnosis of chicken pox is generally made based on that rash that occurs. It's pretty distinct. And you can also culture the viruses from that fluid filled vesicle. You can um, tested on a lawn of bacteria. Remember, you have to have a host for viruses, so you would have to grow a lawn of bacteria and see what virus um, formed plaques on that lawn of bacteria and then culture those and see what they were. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is also used for amplifying the virus to culture it and examine it. PCR is used for a lot of things. It's being used for COVID-19. Um, PCR is excellent um, for trying to look at the genetic components of a virus and identify it that way. Chicken pox is a double-stranded lysogenic DNA virus. That means that it is going to integrate into the host cells. It's going to integrate into the genome and live there. It will stay in your body forever. You are not able to get rid of the chicken pox once it integrates into the genome. Again, remember how your cells are going to multiply, they're going to replicate, and they're going to replicate with that DNA virus integrated into it. It continues. It likes to integrate into the dorsal root ganglion. If you haven't had AMP, that's part of the nervous system. So when shingles occurs, it has a distinct pattern that I'm going to show you in an upcoming slide. So it infects the skin with a blistery rash. This secondary complication um, is called herpes zoster or shingles. You might have heard of it. And it will come back. Something will trigger it to start that lytic cycle and then the blistery, really painful rash will occur along your spine and it will branch out from your spine because it likes to be in the nervous system and in the dorsal root ganglion. 
it is a secondary complication that can be very serious um, following an infection of the chickenpox many, many years later. Eruptions most commonly occur on the thoracic or lumbar regions. That's like in the center of your body um, and along those nerve pathways. So they're fluid-filled vesicles, very similar to what they look like in chickenpox, but more grouped together and very painful. And they can affect the specific nerves that, nerves that they are near or growing um, growing within because it likes to infect the dorsal root ganglion. It gets into those specific cells and it can spread to different nerves. It can spread to the optic nerve and cause um, damage to your eyesight. So those who thought that chicken pox was not a very serious infection, um, unfortunately didn't know that there was this secondary complication called shingles that could cause a very serious type of infection. This is an example of how it will form those little vesicles that are fluid filled that fluid filled that are really painful and grouped together. They're more clustered um, than chicken pox vesicles are. You can see in this slide how it goes in down the center and it will be in that thoracic region and sometimes go all the way down and then it'll branch out like that in those very painful clusters of that rash. So years later, you can have that secondary complication of shingles from chicken pox, but you can also have other very serious complications. Pneumonia can occur and pneumonia can be fatal, especially if chicken pox occurs in an older adult. And it also, if the skin rash is very, very severe, it also can correlate with how severe the pneumonia will be. Encephalitis can occur. Encephalitis is a brain infection. It's a rare complication, but it can occur and it has a 20% mortality. You will have headaches and seizures and coma that will occur if you have this additional complication of encephalitis. Immunocompr immunocompromised patients are also at risk for very serious complications from chickenpox. Your immune system is not able to handle this virus and it will increase inflammation and it can increase the serious complications that are occurring. And again, in those who do not have a good immune system that's trying to work but not doing it in the right way, it can also be fatal for them as well. Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis is an infection that can occur where we become carriers of this. We can be asymptomatic of this infection and we can be shedding it in our oral secretions and not even know we have it. It's really interesting that a very large number of us have this virus within us and we don't even know that we have it. It has a very distinct classic triad of a fever, sore throat, and very swollen lymph nodes. I'm going to show you that in the next slide. They're very swollen. It's a very obvious sign. This is the classic triad for Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis. So you can diagnose by antibody tests because we may have been infected with this virus and not know it and have developed antibodies for it. And so it can be diagnosed that way. Antibiotics should be avoided. This is a virus. We do not give antibiotics for viruses. And 
Giving an antibiotic for a virus like this can cause an increase in complications. What you need to have is supportive ther therapy. You need rest. You need fluids. This makes you feel incredibly fatigued when you are infected with this virus. Again, it has that classic triad that you need to know for Epstein-Barr virus mononucleosis, and do not give antibiotics. Here is an image showing that really swollen lymph node. It's massively swollen. It's just not, you know, when you're sick and you go to the doctor and it feels sore when they touch it. It's not like that. It's really swollen and it's an obvious sign of this infection. In addition to being called Epstein-Barr or mononucleosis, it's also a herpes virus. It's herpes virus 4. And again, 90% of adults may carry the virus in our oropharynx or our throat. Um, and we may not know it. We may be asymptomatic. We may not realize that we have been infected with this virus and we are shedding it from the cells in our throat. In the U.S., 50% of children are positive for the virus before the age of five. So this virus is very prevalent, um, but we may not know that we have it. And again, we can have our antibodies tested to see if we have had it before because it infects the B cells of the immune system and it can remain latent for years. It can remain latent for your lifetime even. It's triggered by a stressor, by something that is going to activate it. Just like all the other latent and lysogenic viruses that we have talked about, it is integrated into our genomes and our cells are replicating it as we grow, as our cells replicate. And if it is triggered by a, you're really exhausted, you're taking a final, um, you have a big event coming up, there's something that is going to occur that triggers it to enter into that lytic cycle. When it does, it causes a vigorous inflammatory response. And you will have that classic triad, that fever, the sore throat, and the massively swollen lymph nodes. Diagnosis and treatment for Epstein-Barr mononucleosis, herpes virus 4, um, you will have the diagnosis based on that classic triad and the extreme fatigue that you are having and then an antibody test that will test for the Epstein-Barr virus associated antigens. Treatment again generally is supportive care, rest, and fluids. If the inflammatory response is extreme. You might need to take medication like prednisone, which is a corticosteroid, which helps to reduce the inflammatory response. But again, no antibiotics. There are also complications of Epstein-Barr virus that can occur. It can affect your spleen and your liver. It can affect your nervous system. It can cause an airway obstruction. Long-term chronic complications can include cancer like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause pancreatitis. There's many things that this virus can continue to cause because it stays within your system and it can infect these other organs. 
hantavirus is specifically caused by rodents. Um, it is an infection that occurs via aerosolized rodent saliva, urine, and feces. So if you are in an area cleaning out a garage or a barn or an old home that might be infested or previously infested with mice, if you see mice droppings, you need to wear a mask to protect yourself from stirring up these aerosolized um, particles of the virus that can infect your respiratory system. There also have been several outbreaks at national park areas and the Mount Hood National Park and Forest Park um, have recently been monitoring for hantavirus. You might see signs up if you're out in those areas that say that they are mon monitoring for the hantavirus. Uh, symptoms can begin as a mild fever, kind of like a you might feel like you have a cold, um, but then it is followed by acute respiratory distress syndrome. Diagnosis is by PCR again. A lot of viruses, again, um, are diagnosed by PCR looking at that genetic component. You can also do specific staining uh, for this virus. There is no treatment available other than supportive care. And again, supportive care includes things like rest or fluids, um, taking the time to get better. Again, looking at hantavirus specifically clinically, it causes hanta pulmonary syndrome. And initially, your symptoms start out with a mild fever. It can also include abdominal pain. There are a few respiratory infections, including COVID-19, that have that gastrointestinal connection. And so you might have abdominal pain also. The virus causes pulmonary capillary leaking which causes hypoxia. You are not able to oxygenate. You are not able to exchange oxygen into your bloodstream. The CDC wants to know if you are infected with hantavirus. Again, they're monitoring some areas in Oregon right now um, for hantavirus. Prevention is avoid breathing the air where rodents are suspected. If you're sweeping up that floor and you see rodent droppings, you need to get a mask on to protect yourself from these droplets that are coming from the urinary, the saliva, and their feces. And rodent infestation control is very important because they can spread and then this virus will spread causing this serious respiratory syndrome. The inflammation that can occur um, from the hantavirus can fill the lungs with this fluid, causing that hypoxia, causing the inability to exchange oxygen. You can't exchange oxygen. And so you have hypoxia, you're not able to breathe, and it can be fatal. This is a map from 2016 that's showing the number of cases per state of hantapulmonary syndrome that occurred. Um, you can see that the more uh, cases are in the hot, dry areas like Arizona and New Mexico. Colorado had a really um, high number of cases as well. And it has been in a number of national parks, um, including some of the ones in Colorado. But if you compare California to Oregon, you also need to consider when you look at a map that's just showing you the number of cases, you need to consider the population as well. Because yeah, Oregon had 20 cases and California had 60. You need to understand that the population of California is much, much 
higher. So us having 20 cases is not the best. Although Washington had more cases than we did, we still need to think about how um, it is an infection that can occur in Oregon and it is a occurring because we have some rodents that are leaving behind their feces and their saliva and their urine and we're becoming infected by it. So it is something we need to think about in our state as well. Okay, let's do some review questions. Scarlet fever rashes are A, vesicular, B, pustular, C. Papular, D. Macular, E. Bullis. The answer is D. Macular. Remember, it's that red macular rash that can blanch. It turns white when you touch it, but then it goes back to that red macular rash. doesn't have any fluid associated with it, but it's red and it can be spread um, on the body. Varicella zoster is a lysogenic DNA virus. This means once you get chickenpox, the virus is permanently integrated into your DNA. B, once you get chickenpox, the infected cells are lysed and your immune system clears the virus. C, the varicella zoster virus is dormant after symptoms are cleared? The answer is A. Once you get chicken pox, the virus is permanently integrated into your DNA, which means you can have an occurrence of shingles later on. That's how chicken pox um, causes the secondary complication by integrating into the DNA and you replicate it and it can come um, and cause a serious painful rash of shingles. I also want you to think about how if you have an active case of the shingles, you are able to give chicken pox to someone who may not be vaccinated for the chicken pox or may not have had the infection of chicken pox. They are at risk for chicken pox. You can give them chicken pox if you have the shing if you have shingles um, but you can't give them shingles because shingles is a secondary complication, right? So, if you are a grandparent and you have shingles, you don't want to be around your grandbaby that maybe hasn't had a vaccine or maybe hasn't had the virus because you can expose them to chicken pox and they can become very sick. So do know that you can give chicken pox to someone if you are infected with shingles and have a flare-up and the rash, um, you are able to give that chicken pox virus to someone who doesn't have the vaccine or hasn't had the virus. You kiss someone who carries the Epstein-Barr virus. A, you will now get mono. B, you may get mono. C, you will not get mono. The answer is... Well, you might get mono or you might not get mono. Remember, a large number of us already have that virus. We are already carriers. We are asymptomatic. It's in a lysogenic state. It needs to be triggered by something. It needs to be triggered to enter into that lytic, si lytic state. This is not a kissing disease like it's been called for a very long time. Yeah, you might get mono. I mean, if you're immunocompromised or you have a really big test coming up or you're under a lot of stress, something has to trigger the virus to make you sick. So kind of B, kind of C. 
Once you have the Epstein-Barr virus in your oropharynx, you will get sick A, when the virus reaches a threshold of enough infected cells, B, when your body's immune system is impaired and no longer holds the virus population in check, C, you will not get sick. So based on what I just said and what we've talked about before about Epstein-Barr, the answer is B. When your body's immune system is impaired, something triggers it and it will no longer hold the virus population in check. Something has to trigger it to move from the lysogenic state to the lytic state. It has to be activated for some reason. And a lot of times it's when our immune system is impaired. Name two diseases that can be treated by acyclovir that we have seen in chapters 21 and 22. That would be herpes simplex virus 1 that causes the cold sores. And we can also treat, if it's very, very severe, we can treat chickenpox with acyclovir. Let's look at some more case studies now. In a worst case scenario, an earthquake could cause all the buildings in a city to fall down into rubble. Rats would be super excited about this scenario. Name a rodent-borne disease that could pose significant risk to the survivors of a Portland earthquake that we have talked about in this chapter. So what type of rodent-borne disease could be occurring here? There, are, there is another one that we're going to talk about later on, but for this chapter, the answer is hantavirus because rats and mice are all considered to be rodents. And if they are having a good time, then they could be spreading hantavirus. Your brother calls you and tells you he thinks he has strep throat, but isn't sure. He is experiencing a painful sore throat and has small little red bumps in the back of his oral cavity. What do you tell him? Are antibiotics appropriate in this case? First, when you look at this, you need to figure out what it is that he might have. Then you have to think about is it a virus or a bacteria and whether it can be treated with antibiotics. I would think that he might have strep throat and I would tell him to go to the doctor because he needs to be treated with antibiotics if it is strep throat because untreated strep throat can have complications like rheumatic fever or scarlet fever. Those are very serious complications that can occur when strep throat is not treated. So I would tell him to go to the doctor and yes, antibiotics are appropriate in this case. A pre-nursing student comes to urgent care during finals week. She complains that it, it hurts to swallow and she has a fever of 103 and very swollen lymph glands. What is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis should be Epstein-Barr virus, mononucleosis, human herpes virus 4. Um, one of those three um, is what this is because that's the classic triad of a sore throat, a fever, and those very seriously swollen lymph glands. So that's the end of part one of chapter 22, the respiratory system infections. There are a lot of infections that I want to cover in this particular chapter, and that's why I'm breaking it up into two parts. First of all, it's hard to upload um, without losing sound on slides when my uh, uploads are really large. And so I'm trying to keep them around an hour so that I can upload them um, and keep all the sound with all the slides. So this is the end of part one of chapter 22. And there will be a second part. So please look for it. Okay. Thank you. Bye.